you wonderful, wonderful people. Would you do that for the Lord for just a moment? God is great in this house. There are many things that I could do here this morning, and I have felt many things, but I want to discuss with you something that has always been precious to me, and I trust that it will be to you also. I want to read, I'm sure most of you could quote it from memory, by heart. But in the book of Psalms, and most people don't understand this, they will say Psalm chapter 24. They're not chapters. They were hymns. They were psalms. They were sung in the temple of old. And David, of course, is basically the great author and songwriter of this entire book. But there is one song, there is one psalm that is paramount to most people who identify as Christians. Psalm 23. Here, David wrote and sang in this magnificent poetic style, prose poetry. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely, Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I simply want to entitle this today, You Need the Shepherd. Would you lift your hands, your voices, and your hearts, and would you pray with me for just a moment before you are seated? Lord Jesus, this morning, in the richness, the opulence of your power and glory here, I'm asking, O oh God, that you will condescend to us, that you will walk among us, O oh God, here today, that you will wrap your arms of love around us, that the depths and the glory of your revelation and understanding will permeate our hearts, minds, souls, and bodies as it were, that you, O oh God, will lift us to a higher level. You have done great things among these marvelous people in the last few days. Now, O oh Master of the universe, wrap your arms of love around us. Help us to hear the voice of the great shepherd. Help us to feel the touch of the master's hand and the protection of your mighty staff. We give you praise, glory, and honor. We ask these things in your blessed and wonderful name. And everyone said, Amen. The Lord bless you. Thank you for standing so long. You may be seated. Would you lift your hands, your voices, and would you just praise him or clap if you so desire, but would you just worship him one more time because he is worthy of our praise. And in the words of King David, clap your hands, all ye people, and shout 
unto the Lord with a voice of triumph because there is triumph in this house. David was an old man. He had long since hung up his harp after he first wrote and sang this song. Psalm 23 is the most used psalm in the entire Bible, quoted in shrapnel shredded foxholes at the side, the bedsides of the dying, in hospitals, in private homes, in prayer meetings, in private devotions, quoted, people have clung to the promises of these six verses, perhaps more than any other in the entirety of the Bible. David had lived long enough to know all about it. And what's interesting to me is this. He compared God to an old weather-beaten shepherd, sun-tanned and raw-boned. David dared to compare God to an old shepherd. He looked back and said, The Lord is my shepherd. Psychologists use this when they are testing people to know something about their inner personality and persons. They ask a question, and the question is, as they look into the faces of their clients, if you could be an animal, what kind of an animal would you be? Some have answered and said, I would be a lion, father of the jungle. I would roar and everyone would tremble and bow down to me. That would tell you a great deal about that person's personality. Others have said, I would be an elephant. I would be big and strong, impregnable, and I would blow water from my trunk on those who opposed me. That also would tell you quite a bit about that individual's inner person. Others have said, I would be a leopard. I would be sleek, strong, and fast. But nobody, nobody ever says, I would be a sheep. When all along and all the time, that is exactly what we are. America would never choose a sheep for its national animal. Russia would never use a sheep as a national emblem. They chose rather a roaring bear. Why would people never say, I'm a sheep? Why do nations not use a sheep as that particular emblem to represent the nation? The reason that America chose the American eagle rather than the Turkey, because the country was settled in the Northeast, where I now live, and wild turkeys are just dominant all over that area. And at first, there was some suggestion that they would use the wild turkey as the national emblem. But they did some research on the turkey, and that wasn't exactly what they wanted to represent them. The reason that they chose the eagle is because the eagle is the only creature that will not run from a storm. It will fly into the storm and fight it. And in so doing, the storm and the currents lift it above the clouds, above the storm, and it floats effortlessly in the atmosphere above the storm below. And that is exactly what America has done through all of its existence. It has never run from a battle or a strong storm. It has run into it, and God has lifted it above it with victory and glory. <laughs> Clap your hands and lift your voice on behalf of America. And could you say here today, God bless America. 
Hallelujah! In Jesus' name. The reason that people never say, I am a sheep, is because sheep are defenseless. They don't have fangs. They don't have claws. And they're very easily influenced. They're very easily led. In fact, sheep are basically referred to as being dumb and stupid. Nobody wants to say, I am that way. But this old man, David, a shepherd, had lived long enough, been through enough to admit, I am a sheep and I do need a shepherd. And God, you are the greatest shepherd that I could ever have. I need a shepherd. And if you'll just be my shepherd, God, I shall not want. The greatest shepherd I can think of, God, is you. And so he sang this timeless, Im immortal hymn to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and likened him to an old, suntanned, raw-boned shepherd who could wield the staff and could wield the power to deliver him from all of his enemies. I grew up on a farm in Iowa, and there were those that did have sheep. And I learned a lot of things about sheep from the farmers roundabout. And one of the things I learned was sometimes the farmers would become very frustrated because in the evening when the sheep came in and they called them in, there'd be one missing. And they had no idea where it was. And so the only thing that could be done was to go out and search the field or the pasture over to try to find that one sheep. And they would have stories, and they would always have frustration in their voices. But in spite of the frustration, they'd always do it over and over again. They would find a very strong, healthy uh, sheep. And it had decided to lie down sometime during the day and rest or sleep. And there was a little sunken place in the ground, and it just sort of laid down in that little sunken place. And when it tried to get up, because it was in this little sunken place, it wasn't easy to get up, and they wouldn't fight or struggle to get up. They would just lie right there because it was too difficult to get up. And the shepherd would come and either boot them or get a hold of them and pull on them, and they'd struggle and get up, and then they'd run back to the barn. People are very much like that. We are very much like that. If things don't go exactly the way we want them to go, if God doesn't do it exactly the way we want it done or think it should be done, we will just lie down and make no effort to fight, to get up, and to carry on. That's why pastors go after you. That's why men of God will go after you. I mean, people really. I've pastored three times. It's amazing how people can be. It's amazing. The, I remember some people, if you didn't speak to them when they came to church, the whole service was ruined. They didn't hear the song service. They didn't sing. They didn't listen to the preaching. They were preoccupied with, he didn't speak to me. She didn't speak to me. They're talking against me. They don't like me. They missed everything. Let me tell you how I really am, okay? I don't care if you speak to me or not. I didn't come to see you. I came to see Jesus. That's exactly how it is. But if we all see Jesus, guess what? We'll all speak at the end of the service. So don't worry about what people do or don't do. Get your eyes on Jesus. 
clap your hands to Him, worship Him, cry out to Him, sing the songs of Zion, because everything is going to be all right if you can touch the hem of His garment, if you can hear His voice, if you can get a hold of His hand, He will lift you up and you will walk powerfully. Clap your hands, all ye people, for the God of David, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and shout the victory to a master shepherd. Hallelujah. You say, but Brother Stone King, I'm not easily influenced. <clears throat> Think about the first cigarette you ever smoked. Why? You didn't want it. But your friends it made you sick on top of it. Think about when you drank your first beer, shot your first dope. A good girl or a good boy suddenly becomes a tramp influence. Sheep are easily led and they're defenseless. But if they have a good shepherd, he will be their speed. He will be their fangs. He will be their protector. A shepherd. I've got to have a shepherd. We are weak. That is why we need to pray. We need to fast. We need to know the shepherd is still around. I shall not want. I've told people for years, there is no problem here bigger than God. The problem doesn't exist that is bigger than Jesus. He can do anything. He can do everything. He can do all things. Nothing shall be impossible to them that believe. He can make a way where there is no way. People have said to me, well, Brother Stone King, you're so positive. How is God going to do all this stuff? I don't know how God is going to do all of it. I just know he's going to do it. I don't need the whys and the wherefores and all the details. I just know he is going to do it. And victory is sweet because I have the victory. The battle has been won. I am on the side of the victor. He will get us through. He will get us out of here. Hallelujah. Any day now he may come in the clouds of glory. Shout, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. David went on to say, he maketh me. I think that's interesting terminology. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. If there is anything that sheep will do, it's wonder. That's how marriages break up. Sheep wonder. They wonder how it would be with someone else. It's exactly what happens. But the shepherd, when he sees one of his flock wandering, he will take that sheep in the middle of the pasture and press that sheep down into the cool green grass till that sheep knows that that is the safest place in the world for him. The pastor of the church is an under-shepherd to Jesus, but the duty of that pastor is to keep you in the cool green pastures of love, grace, and mercy. The shepherd's staff, they're made of olive wood. And there is one that has sort of a crook on it. The other one just has a knob on the end of it. And that particular staff can crack a skull. When the sheep wanders, the shepherd can reach out with that staff and just hit it 
on the head and get its attention. God does that to us. I think this is just incredible information because I've been to Israel 19 times and I am going to go again with the help of the Lord. I love that land. There's nothing like it in all the world. The Bible becomes a whole new book to you once you've been there. But in that land, and they still have their shepherds and their flocks exactly as in biblical times. They still do it exactly the way they did it thousands of years ago. If a new lamb is born, and that lamb will not stay close to the mother and not stay close to the shepherd, always at the edge of the flock, wandering off. They're very curious. Sheep are very curious creatures. They'll leave the flock and just sniff at some big bush. Curious. Behind it is a jackal. And the shepherd knows if that sh lamb does not stay close to him or that mother with the rest of the flock, it will be destroyed by the, by the animals, by the predators that seek the lives of those innocent sheep. So if that lamb will not do what's right and insist on being unruly, the shepherd knows how to do this. He'll take that little lamb, and I've held them. They're like holding nothing. They're like holding air. They're absolutely weightless, those newborn lambs. They're just weightless. The shepherd will take that little lamb, and he will snap one of the legs. He'll just break it. He knows how to do it. Then he has a splint made, and he will reset the leg, the bone, and he'll wrap it. Well, now it's very difficult for that little lamb to just run off any place. He can hardly walk. So the shepherd lifts it up in his left arm with the staff in the right arm, and he holds that little lamb in his left arm near to his heart on his breast. And that lamb, resting, sleeping, being carried, feeling and hearing the heartbeat of the shepherd. By the time that bone is healed and set and the splint is taken off, that lamb leaning and resting and sleeping on the breast of the shepherd will have fallen in love with the shepherd. And once that splint is taken off and that lamb is put down, that little lamb will follow right at the heels of that shepherd and never leave him saved. And there are times I've watched among our own people when people will not do that which is right. And the shepherd keeps calling. The master keeps calling. God knows if something isn't done, you'll be lost. And he comes down and he breaks, as it were, your leg until you are forced to lean on him, until you are forced to cry out to him until there is no other refuge, there is no other recourse. And by the time the battle is won, because of leaning on his breast, hearing his voice, and feeling the heartbeat of the master shepherd himself, you have fallen so in love with Jesus that you will not leave him. You will follow right after him. I'm talking to many of us who have been there through the years. David knew what it was like to wonder. Bathsheba, beautiful Bathsheba. Nathan the prophet came and cracked David's skull and said, David, you're a scoundrel. That preacher could have lost his life for talking to the king that way. But a real preacher has no choice but to tell you the truth. As a preacher, I'm in the most precarious position because God says, tell them. And sometimes people say, I don't want to hear it. And so I'm caught between the people and God, but devoted to him. Having been called by him, I am forced to preach what thus saith the Lord. And I've come to grips with understanding and realization. This gospel only works on the hungry and the thirsty. It does not work on the scoffer nor the mocker. I'm not looking for scoffers or mockers. I'm looking for those that are hungry and thirsty for God.
I've thought more than once in the last three and a half years. I've thought to myself, Stone King, how many people have you tried to take to heaven in 44 years that had no intention of going? I thought to myself, I'm done with all of that. I'm not going to give all my time to losers. I'm going to find winners. And I'm going to give my time to winners to reach this world. We don't have time to deal with losers. I don't believe you people are losers. That's why I keep coming back here. I'm talking to a bunch of winners. But I understand that you can be lifted to a higher level of operation, to a higher level of authority, to a higher level of power and the master shepherd is here to press you down into the cool green grass of his kingdom thou art the man David it broke David it snapped him but it saved him <laughs> That's why David could say, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. God has a way of making us to lie down in green pastures. Something very interesting in the old country in Israel, when the shepherds bring the sheep in at night, they have these... Um, these places, many times it's just um, a wall of stone in a circular fashion. Sheepfolds, I think they call them. But they have an opening, they have a doorway into this sheepfold so that animals cannot crawl in at night, a wild beast cannot get to them. And uh, the shepherd watches the gate or the opening, the door of this particular sheepfold. <clears throat> but when the sheep come in at night and he counts them, he'll take um, a long rod a piece of a long stick, and he'll just lay it um, at the opening of this sheepfold, probably about maybe six inches above the, the ground. And what he does is he makes those sheep, as they come into the fold, jump over that, that rod. Well, it's only about four or five inches or six inches above the surface of the ground. And most sheep will jump over. But if one will not jump over... He knows there's something wrong with that sheep. That sheep is ill. It's sick. It's not feeling well. So he pulls that sheep aside after all the others are in to give it some kind of special attention. Why do you think <clears throat> your pastor gets in the pulpit and says, let's all stand? He's trying to see if he'll jump over. Why do you think he says, would you lift your hands and praise God? He's trying to get you to jump over as you come into this marvelous fold where there's protection and power. Why do you think he says, let's all clap our hands? <laughs> He's trying to see if you will jump over if you're well spiritually. If you just sit there and stare... He knows something is wrong with you. There is a problem. There is a sickness inside of you. He will pull you aside and try to find out exactly what is wrong with you. There may be a cut. There may be a bruise. There may be a fever. But he wants to find out what's wrong with this particular sheep. So if you don't want to give yourself away, the best thing you can do, dear friend, is cooperate to the limit. You ought to be on your feet. You ought to be standing. You ought to be clapping your hands. You ought to be worshiping God because everything will be all right. And if you worship him, if you seek him, you will find him. And what you came in with will be stripped away and you'll walk out with the victory. Clap your hands again and worship him in spirit and in truth. Hallelujah. Sheep hate water. They're, they're afraid of it. <clears throat> they know somehow if they ever get that wool wet, they will just sink like a rock. They're afraid, especially of water that's moving. So when the shepherd leads the sheep 
to green pastures and waters. Many times the water is not still. It'll be, it'll be a flowing stream. Sheep are afraid of that. So what he does is he'll take a staff or rod or a piece of timber of some kind, and he'll just lay it across across the, the stream, the water. And then he'll gather some, some bushes and some, some uh, leafy uh, branches, and he'll just lay it on the, on the side the, of, the, of the staff where the f stream, the flow, is coming. And on this side, the water will be still. The sheep will not go here where it's moving, but they will come here where the water is still, and they will drink. When the water of your life becomes too turbulent, God will lay a staff of his power across it, and he will shield it and slow down the turbulence of the waters of your life so that you can drink in safety and security. He'll make a way for you where there literally is no way. He will hinder the flow. That's why David, as a shepherd, could say, He leadeth me beside still waters. People are afraid of stormy seas. <clears throat> we need preachers who can stop the raging so that wandering, fearing sheep can drink from still waters. I really have believed this for years and years. Preachers will become the most important people in the entire world at the end of this age. Somebody has got to have the power. I believe before this is over, before Jesus comes, the whole book of Acts will be reenacted seven times greater than what you read about there before the coming of the Lord in the clouds of glory. But already the winds of turbulence are beginning to blow. The sea of life is beginning to become tossed. It's out of control. I believe the most powerful people at the end of the age will not be kings or queens or dictators or ruthless leaders or presidents. I believe it will be an anointed man of God, a prophet of God that God raises up that can step to the bow of your ship and say, peace be still to the angry sea of your life and it will become placid. We are headed for the most unusual times this world has ever known or ever seen. The most powerful people will be anointed men and women of God before this thing ends. In the Old Testament, the kings feared the prophets because the prophets could stop the rain and they could start it. There is no way to fight God. There is no way to fight his sovereignty. There is no way to fight his power. There is nothing. He can send a tornado. He can send a hurricane. He can send a Katrina. And there is nothing that man can do. Man will run like a rat in a rainstorm because he is the master of the universe and he controls it all. I want to be on board his ship. I want to be on board his ship. I want to be on board of the craft where the master can say to the storm, peace, be still. Let your voice out and shout, hallelujah. Jesus, I worship you. David said, he restoreth my soul. We know Adam and Eve sinned, but he restored, he made a way to restore that soul to God. I believe in miracles, you know I do. I preach it as much as anything, the miraculous, signs, wonders, and miracles. I love it all. But I want to tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, friends, visitors. The most powerful thing you will ever see in a Christian church is a sinner. The most miraculous thing you'll ever be eyewitness to is a sinner coming to an altar, bending their knees and crying out to God and God restoring that soul to himself. It is the greatest miracle of all. How is it that 
God can take away your sin, that God can give you a reason to live. Psychologists can't do that. Psychiatry can't do that. Drugs can't do that. The vices of life cannot do that. Alcohol cannot do that. Those are just cheap substitutes for the real thing. But this Jesus, this Holy Ghost, He is the real thing. He is the real thing. And those of you who have come from drugs, from immorality, from unmentionable things, from families that gave up on you, from society that gave up on you, they still don't understand what happened when you came to an altar of prayer and a master shepherd by the wave of his hand, by the sound of his voice, took away a lifetime of sin. And your soul was restored for his name's sake. Say, I'm one of them. We are all one of them. This is not part of my notes, but I feel to say it to you. The biggest mistake we make as children of God, it's the most serious mistake we make. <clears throat> when we fail, however great or small, however significant or insignificant, but in our mind's eye, when we have failed God, we stop coming to church, we stop doing this and stop doing that because we make the mistake of believing it was cried out here today by Sister Cindy. He's a liar. Everyone say, he's a liar. He's a liar. I think you believe that. <laughs> he is a liar. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus of Nazareth, blessed be the name of Jesus. We make the mistake of believing, thinking that God's going to treat us the way we treated him. It's the most serious mistake you'll ever make. God does not treat us the way we treat him. That's why we're all still here. His mercy, His grace will pick you up. He will not turn a repentant heart away. I had a man once in upstate New York. I was preaching on a Sunday morning. There was a move of God, and this man was standing crying back here in the audience, and, but he wouldn't come forward. So I went back to him, and I got in between the men he was standing with and got to praying with him, and I said, you need to come. He, he took his hands down. He said, Brother Stone King, I can't come. I said, why? He said, you don't understand about me. You don't understand. He said, I am too far down. I've gone too far down down. I said, no matter, friend, underneath are the everlasting arms of God that can lift you up. That man started crying. He came with me, and God gave him the Holy Ghost. I don't care how far down you are. You can't get so low, but what underneath are the everlasting arms of God. That's why some of us are here today. That's why some of you are here today, because God reached lower than you thought you could go, and he lifted you up. And he rescued you. One lost sheep you were. But now you are found in the fold and the safety of God's heavenly kingdom. Hallelujah. Would you shout with victory? Victory, victory, victory. Hallelujah. Verse 4, David said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. 
I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but in the land of Israel, there really is a place called the Valley of the Shadow of Death. It's a very steep, narrow valley. It has steep sides and there's darkness in it. And in biblical times, robbers and crooks would hide in the caves and the, behind the rocks in the, in the sides of the steep valley. And they would plunder the caravans that came through or the people that passed through. They would attack them, many times kill them and steal from them. There really is a place called the Valley of the Shadow of Death in Israel. And David was referring to that. But he said, I will fear no evil. Why? Because it's like having a father stand at the other end and invite you to come through. I've known people that had terrible diseases in their bodies and the prognosis was that they would die within a very short time. I've seen some of our people just absolutely through the years as I've pastored and traveled, just they're literally walking in the valley of the shadow of death. But I've watched those people come to church, no matter what was clinging to their bodies in disease and sickness, they would still come to the house of God and they would lift their hands and they would worship God. Some had to have help standing, but they would stand and they would weep and worship Jesus in spite of pain in their bodies and speak with tongues because they could see the master shepherd standing at the end of the valley of the shadow of death and they were on their way to meet him. No matter who was hiding here or what was lurking here, they could see him. I've often thought through the years, before I, especially before I went through what I went through, I thought to myself, death must be the most beautiful experience of all. Because the shepherd stands at the other end and says, come on, sheep, I have won, I have conquered. I've often thought to be absent, the Bible says so, to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. To close your eyes in death and open them in paradise. My experience was different. People have said to me, did you see anything? Did you hear anything? The answer is no, 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 I didn't see anything. Because if I had of if I had seen Jesus and talked with him, if I'd have seen the holy city and angels, there's no way I would have come back here. There is no way I would have come back here. He evidently was not finished with me. So I'm back and I have alerted the devil. I am back and I've got something called resurrection power and I intend to give you the worst battle you have ever had in your existence because there is no power like this power. There is no glory like this glory and that resurrection power was so powerful in this women's conference. Something has happened here. Something was broken in this conference. There were mantles passed out. There was a that was passed out. There were gifts of the Spirit passed out. And wherever you ladies go back to, I tell you, those churches are going to explode. And don't you back away. You just get in the aisles and do there what you did here. You just be authoritative there the way you were here. Because God is looking for channels to flow through in this hour. And I preached here in this conference one of the most glorious things I've seen in the last year and a half or two years. Uh, men are no longer just standing back. Men are becoming aggressive among us. Uh, I've seen fathers take their children on their shoulders and dance down the aisle. I've seen them stand and prophesy. Men are getting into this. You know what that means? It means God is doing something in this hour. There's a strength coming. There's a power coming. There's a unity coming. God is about to do something in this earth and he's getting women together like in this conference to become 
outward to get beyond themselves. Men are becoming aggressive toward the gospel. Even preachers have said to me, Brother Stonekey, I've watched this stuff for years. I'm going to have it. I'm going to get a hold of this. No matter if my crony buddies are in it or not, I'm going to get a hold of this. I'm going to have it. I'm going to see signs. I'm going to see wonders. We're going to have an apostolic church. Something is happening to the United Pentecostal Church. Something is taking place among us that I've not seen in 40, 40 years. But it's here. Revival is not coming. It is here. You ought to be on your feet shouting, welcome, 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 welcome. Yes. Hallelujah, Jesus. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I've never had a second of fear. Not even now. Because when you have Jesus, everything is all right. It's just all right. Mm. I remember I upgraded to first class on a flight one day and I got to talking about God and prophetic things in the end time and before it was over I had the whole first class listening to me and the flight attendants even from the coach were up there listening too <laughs> so when the plane landed and they had to take care of things um, as I was as I stood to get off the flight one of the flight attendants said who are you I said one who knows <laughs> and that's exactly who I am that's who you are, one who knows. Turn to your neighbor and say, I am one who knows. And the world is waiting to hear what you know. Ah, ah. Waiting to hear what you know. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I mentioned before, the staff was to help the sheep. The rod was to defend the sheep and to correct them. The staff had a crook in it. And what was interesting about the shepherd, he'll take that staff with the crook in it and he'll reach up into the high branches where the fruit and the tender leaves are and he'll pull that down for the sheep to eat where they could never reach without him pulling down the lushness in the high places. On the day of Pentecost, the master shepherd, he pulled it down for us. To eat. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. It's very interesting when shepherds in the old country, when they take their flock to new pastures, the shepherd goes ahead of the sheep and he checks out all the ground area. He's looking for serpent holes. He's looking for snake holes, as we would call them. And if he finds one, what he does is he takes the, the end of that staff and he'll just crush in the earth and stomp on it and fill in the opening and then pour oil on the opening of that, that filled in opening so the soil becomes soggy. So the serpent has a very difficult time pushing his head through that soggy soil. And then the shepherd anoints the heads of his sheep with oil. So just in case the serpent does get through that soggy opening and the sheep's head is close, the serpent will smell the oil on the head of the sheep and think he's still in prison. Did you get it? The Holy Ghost. Jesus came and he walked through the pasture, folks. 
He came out of the grave saying, Death, where is thy sting? Grave, where is thy victory? He poured oil on our heads. The Holy Ghost has been given to us. Literally, Jesus poured oil over and the power of God over the very den of Satan. He anointed my head with oil. It's a type of the Holy Ghost. And when the devil runs about and comes near you, he can smell the oil of the Holy Ghost that you've been anointed with. And he realizes that you have conquered him. Say, I am a conqueror. You know what terrorizes the devil most of all? And since I've used the word terrorist, I'm going to throw this in for free. I am so sick of hearing about terrorists and terrorism. I'm sick of it. Sick of hearing it. Sick of reading about it. Sick of it. Sick. You get the point? Sick. I decided one day when I was in my home, I'm a terrorist. I'm going to be a terrorist for Jesus. I'm going to run into places and just blow myself up in the Holy Ghost. We ought to be absolutely just fanatic in this hour. If they can blow themselves up and kill people, why can't we just blow ourselves up in Jesus? I'm a Holy Ghost terrorist. I am a terrorist for Jesus. I would to God this whole church would get into terrorism. Holy Ghost terrorism. I'm going to cast you out, devil. I'm going to put you back in the pit from which you have come. I'm going to lay hands on the sick. I'm going to rout this disease out. I'm going to take dominion control. I'm going to take the power over this entire situation. That's the kind of thing you've got a hold of inside of you. It is explosive. You are explosive. Clap your hands again and shout like a terrorist for Jesus. The devil cannot understand how when everything is upside down for you, you still come to church and worship Jesus. He doesn't get that. He doesn't get it because he's wired for trouble. That's all he knows. We're wired for victory. We're wired. We're wired for worship. He gave me feet to dance with. He gave me hands to clap. He gave me a voice to praise him with. He gave me a heart to receive him. He gave me a mind to comprehend. In other words, I'm possessed. Say, I'm possessed. Mm. 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 Demon possessed people demonstrate anywhere because the devil can draw. I would to God we would become Holy Ghost possessed and we would just demonstrate in restaurants. We would just demonstrate on the streets. We would get involved with the thing that we really are. Why not? Why not? He's coming anyhow. We might as well give it everything we have got. Yes! Say, I am excited. Mm. Hallelujah. My cup runneth over the fatted calf the best robe the well is deep God had a cup in the Old Testament David knew about that but in the New Testament he gave us a well oh. no matter what I've gone through in the background, I could always hear the master shepherd drawing water and pouring it for me. Drawing water and pouring it for me. And all I had to do was go and drink because he is the true shepherd. 
God did it all for me. All for me. And I close with this. What a wonderful audience you are here. What precious people you are here. You're really a family to me. I'm a family to you. I feel closer to you people than I do blood relatives that aren't in the church. You know why? Because we are born of the same father. We are born of the same mother. The Holy Ghost is our father. The church is our mother. And we can come here and crawl up on the lap of our heavenly father and hear his voice. It's amazing, isn't it? <clears throat> on one of the tours to Israel, coming from the southern part of the country back up toward Jerusalem, <clears throat> you looked out the windows of the bus. There was a shepherd with sheep down there, and there was a stream. And the shepherd had crossed that little stream, and he was standing over there calling for the sheep to come across. But as I said, sheep are fearful of water, and they wouldn't cross. They came up to the edge of that water, but they wouldn't step in it. And the shepherd kept walking away, just backwards, to, to, to encourage them to come across. But even though he was disappearing from them, they wouldn't come across. So, what he did was, he walked back across the stream, walked in among the flock, and took up a newborn lamb, put it in his arm, and that little lamb began to bleat. And he walked with that lamb back across the water and walked up just a little bit, up that incline there. And the mother, that old you, she saw her baby on the other side of that stream. She came to that water's edge and bleated. She just bellowed, but he just kept walking very slowly. All of a sudden, she just jumped into that water and just struggled through it. It wasn't very deep, but they're just afraid of it. And she splashed and got on the other side. Once she crossed, all the other sheep began to come, and they began to cross also. It's very fearful to me, but it's the mercy and love of God. Sometimes when he can't get us to cross over, he will come back across and he will pick up something precious to us and take it to the other side in order to get us to come across the stream of life and to reunite with the precious jewel that has been taken from us. I pray today in the name of Jesus for revelation to come upon you right now, for something to happen in your heart and mind of great worth that suddenly you begin to understand how valuable you are to the master shepherd. If you have any concept of your value to the master shepherd and the goodness of God in your life, would you stand and lift both hands and worship? If you really feel it, if you really feel it, if you feel your worth. That's it. Let your voice out. Just let your voice out and begin to worship Him. Oh, One more time, just shout the voice of victory.
Hallelujah. Does anybody feel like just running, just running to the master today? Do you just feel like running down that aisle, just running down that aisle to the master today? In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, by the authority of the word of God, by the power of the name of Jesus, there is freedom. The master shepherd has set you free. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. It is time for the rejoicing. It is time to shout with victory. It is time to worship with victory because I need a shepherd and I've got the best shepherd of all. His name is Jesus. He anointeth my oil, my head with oil, my cup runneth over. The devil has been alerted. He is in prison. The serpent is in prison. Hallelujah! Blessed be the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Keep on coming. I invite you to keep on coming. There is a glorious, glorious move of God here today. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Sister, Sister Haney and I both feel that there are many men in this audience here. The men in this audience today want what I'm talking about. They want that aggressiveness. They want that power. And I just feel like if the women here will go get their husbands and bring them down to the front and just lay hands on them and pray, something will happen that will be transferred and the homes of this entire congregation will be changed forever. 
So ladies, get a hold of your husband. Take the hand of your husband. Bring him to the front and we're going to pray that an aggressiveness, an anointing comes upon every man that is in this place. In the name of Jesus. 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 And if you're a man here and you don't have a wife, there are other men that will lay hands on you. But let's just pour in. Let's just come Come to the front and begin to lay hands on each other. That's it. Wives, lay hands upon your husbands in the name of Jesus and begin to pray by the authority of the Word of God, by the power of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. That's it. That's it. It's happening right here. It's happening right here. It's happening right there. There in the name of Jesus. Here in the name of Jesus. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Yes, receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Yes. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah! 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 In the name of Jesus! 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 Let it be so! Let it be so now! The power, the aggressiveness, the authority, the holy boldness with wisdom in the name of Jesus to come upon every head of household, every man in this congregation in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. That's it. 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 Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah! Yes! the name of Jesus. It, people, you can feel it. It's not something we're just doing. You can actually feel it. It's happening. It is happening. It's happening in the name of Jesus. So you've got it. You have got it in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Jesus, at this point, everybody get a hold of somebody. Everybody get a hold of somebody in the name of Jesus and begin to pray in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, yes. In the name of Jesus, yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, 